the James Webb Space Telescope. Been working on it for quite a while, and uh, hopefully can uh, help share a little bit about what it's going to do. Um, it's a big project for a lot of people. I stole a lot of these slides from people. I made some of my own, and some of the people that I stole slides from had stolen my stuff to put on the slides, so I don't feel so bad about that. <laughs> and uh, my role is that, uh, so yeah, I guess I'm nominally badge at NASA Ames. I'm on, uh, I do have guaranteed time, so I want to make sure this thing gets built right, so I want to make observations with it. And on two of the instrument teams, the mid-infrared team, which is a joint US and European team, and uh, NIRCAM, which is uh, uh, led out of the University of Arizona, but we actually actually uh, built it uh, on the peninsula in uh, Palo Alto, at the Lockheed Martin uh, Advanced Technology Center. Let's get this over first. Uh, who is James Webb? Who's this guy? You know, normally NASA does not name a telescope until the thing has been launched and is successful because you know you really don't want to name it and then have it get canceled or blow up or something like that, right? But James Webb was, I think, a, a great person to name this telescope after. Uh, the, the NASA administrator, Sean O'Keefe, named this after James Webb. And uh, he was uh, probably at, at NASA's helm during uh, its most exciting time. So uh, he was running NASA when uh, the Mercury spaceflight program was going, uh, the uh, Gemini program, and then started the Apollo program. He also uh, uh, brought in space science missions. He realized that it was important to do uh, science and understand these bodies in the solar system and uh, uh, started this Mariner, which went to uh, inner solar system bodies, and uh, also uh, Voyager, which went out to the outer planets. And uh, it was really uh, the person to uh, uh, definitely uh, ensure and he uh, had the oversight to, to uh, uh, make sure that NASA had uh, science in addition to just the manned space flight because uh, I think we'd be in pretty sad shape without that right now. So it was a, a very apt person to name this telescope after. So this is going to be a pretty general purpose telescope. However, whenever you do something, you need to kind of sketch out some big picture questions and make sure it can answer big question, big picture questions. If you're going to put a lot of effort into building an observatory, and you figure that if you do enough uh, progress on big picture questions, then it should have enough capabilities to uh, to, to to take whatever uh, is out there and, and do good science no matter what happens. So um, it is pretty much going to be the successor of Hubble. And uh, almost uh, all the time on it is going to be open to people in the U.S. and European community. It's 80% uh, U.S., 20% uh, European. And uh, submit applications, and then uh, the best ones get rated highest, hopefully. And uh, Hubble is oversubscribed by about 9 to 1, so it will probably be about the same here. And we came up with some science themes and uh, illustrated them in this, uh, uh, there's a book about JWC science. This one, uh, let's see, oh, it's, oh, yeah, pointer works, sort of. Uh, this this uh, Space Science Reviews down on the bottom right uh, is available online, I checked. You can uh, download it, it's about 110 pages, it's pretty technical. And then something a little glossier, but uh, also uh, conveys a lot of the science is that uh, book on the right, uh, James Webb Space Telescope Science Guide. So the four themes that we came up with, this was uh, around uh, the turn of this last uh, century and millennium. Uh, it was always designed, wanted to see what were the first objects that lit up in the universe after the Big Bang. Big Bang, you know, really hot gas explodes. First three minutes, all the particles we know of get created. And uh, then everything cools. Uh, hydrogen atoms form after about uh, 300,000 years and everything cools off. But uh, at some point, gravity starts pulling stuff together because they're in homogeneities, and uh, galaxies form, and other things form. So what were those first objects? Were they galaxies? Were they black holes, or what? So we want to be able to actually observe them. We can't observe them with anything on the ground or anything with hope. Uh, another question is, uh, how do the shapes of these galaxies evolve? Uh, how do the structures evolve? We know they're spiral galaxies, they're elliptical galaxies. Uh, actually, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of progress in understanding that evolution through Hubble and looking back in time. But uh, we want to see how things evolve from the very first galaxies with uh, uh, having a very high spatial resolution telescope that can see through the dust. We also want to uh, understand better how stars and planets form in our own uh, galaxy. And uh, 
we, uh, there are a lot of mysteries there, so that's very relevant to how the Earth formed in our planetary system. And we also want to uh, be able to understand the chemistry in a lot of astrophysical situations by uh, taking spectra, dispersing the light, see what elements and uh, molecules are present. And uh, where are building blocks of life? Where are these uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? Where are these uh, other hydrocarbons in, the, uh, in, in other stars and solar systems? So we... Uh, uh, if you kind of group these into some big questions that we think this observatory addresses up at the top there. So, you know, how did the universe form? Is our solar system unique? Uh, are we alone? I don't know how far we'll get down that. We are, you know, it's not a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but maybe we can see if the building blocks of life are elsewhere. We think they already are from Spitzer. Then uh, those flow into those uh, four themes there. So. Uh, well, those are just sort of the shorthand for the four that I uh, mentioned on the other page. I don't want to read, read them all through, but it's basically from the very distant early universe to uh, you know very nearby planetary systems. So we figured that if a telescope can do all that, it's uh, going to be pretty well set to uh, do lots of interesting science. I'm going to walk you through some examples of these different science themes uh, using a common graphic here. Let me see if I can uh, get this uh, mouse to work at all. I saw it skidding around earlier. That's nice. Okay. So here uh, is the Big Bang in this picture. And then uh, on this axis, on this x-axis, we have time going this way. Okay. So this is us over here. Uh, 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, or whatever. And uh, a lot of stuff has happened between then and now, believe it or not. So that's what uh, this graph is supposed to show. And then uh, this axis, uh, the other axis, the y axis, is sort of the expansion of space. So the Big Bang, uh, the universe gets created, the whole fabric of space and time, very high energy. Eventually, everything. Uh, uh, gets bigger, and by uh, getting bigger, every, if, uh, if, if uh, energy is conserved, everything inside gets cooler, uh, particles form. Then after like 300,000 years, uh, gets, the temperature gets down to about 3,000 degrees, and that's uh, cool enough for protons and electrons to combine, so you start getting hydrogen atoms, the most abundant element in the universe. Over 90% of the universe is hydrogen. And that's as far back as we can see. Uh, you know, all these uh, measurements of the cosmic uh, microwave background and all that, you can only see back to the point where uh, hydrogen and uh, hydrogen atoms existed because uh, anything before there, uh, the light would just get scattered and we uh, couldn't see it. So uh, all, all the measurements of the microwave background are from here and like the recent bicep measurements from the South Pole. But, uh, and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, the universe cools off and then at some point, you know, galaxies form. If the Hubble, we can see back to here, like uh, about a billion years after the Big Bang, but we can't see in this uh, dark region from like uh, 300,000 years to like a uh, 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 billion years or so. And um, we want to see those first objects that lit up. Uh, gravity probably is what pulled everything together, but it's, people have a hard time understanding how stars form. There's only hydrogen. You need uh, metals for things to cool. You need uh, heavier elements. And uh, it didn't really, they didn't really exist, so we'll uh, hopefully learn a lot from that. This, uh, over, this shows yeah, where some of the observatories are. I think uh, so this is one that, uh, uh, that, that first found uh, any kind of asymmetries in the microwave background. And Hubble sees to here, I think I mentioned. The um, uh, pictures over here sort of show how structure, how we think structure may have evolved in the universe, where very early on, there's, uh, the universe is al almost totally uniform. It's like uh, uh, only like one part in 100,000 or a few parts in 100,000 uh, sort of uh, clumping. And then gravity pulls stuff together and eventually get these filaments. And as time goes on, and then creates a galaxy. So we need to fill that in. That's just our cartoon understanding of it. Then uh, the questions that you can ask from that period are, uh, you know, how did black holes form? Uh, how do they interact with galaxies? Because we only seeing them now at periods where they're both well established together in one form before the other. Uh, as I mentioned, what are the natures of these first galaxies? Uh, what, uh, how, how luminous are they? What are, what are their masses? If you do some back of the envelope calculations. The first galaxies should maybe be about the mass of uh, globular clusters around the Milky Way, so not very big. 
but is that really what happened? Uh, when did this reionization occur? And that reionization is uh, uh, when the light from these first objects uh, the, uh, starts to ionize the hydrogen again, because like I said, the Big Bang cools, uh, the hydrogen forms, then uh, gravity pulls us together, stars form, they get hot, and then they start to reionize the, the universe again. And, uh, uh, and then, again, what caused that? Was it the galaxies, or was it uh, black holes in the galaxies? This sort of shows the diagnostic power of uh, infrared here. Sorry for, it's a bit of an eye chart, but this is a uh, Hubble image here uh, showing a very, very distant galaxy, uh, a redshift of 7.6, one of the most distant galaxies. Can't see anything. Hubble couldn't detect it in, uh, in the visible. However, Hubble did see it here in uh, the two microns wavelength near infrared, and it's Spitzer, it's a tiny telescope. It's uh, eight tenths of a centimeter, uh, brilliant mirror. Uh, it was booming and, and detected it quite easily uh, at lo longer wavelengths. So uh, these galaxies are tremendously redshifted, is what that means. And I can sort of see here what's going on, and that uh, the galaxies have a characteristic shape in this reionization epoch, because uh, the very uh, shortest wavelength light, this ultraviolet, is, will get absorbed by all the uh, neutral hydrogen that's still, that's still around, and you won't see it. So if uh, we, let's see if I can find the mouse again. So the black is the shape of uh, the spectrum of the galaxies, and that's moving across these different James Webb filters at the redshift. So that's redshift of 16 there. And so now you can see light in the right filters, but there won't be any light in the left filters. And by seeing which filters have light and which ones don't, you can get an idea of the redshift of these galaxies. And we can uh, get more details uh, for these candidates and uh, put them into spectrographs. So, uh, once we identify these first galaxies, we want to understand how galaxies evolve as uh, the universe got older. The, uh, uh, we have some pictures here. These are about the most distant galaxies that uh, Hubble can see. It is in the top left. Right in, uh, in the pointer. Oh, yeah, I saw it somewhere. Okay. So uh, a bunch of funny shapes, very red. And, uh, uh, but is, are these the shapes of the original galaxies? And... Uh, how much uh, is this influenced by mergers? How did uh, the whole Hubble sequence get uh, established? So that's this period in this diagram, Big Bang here, us uh, so over here. This is in this phase here where uh, galaxies have already formed. We want to study how their shapes vary over time to get into uh, the present epoch. And uh, uh, the more detailed questions, uh, like how big of a role did galaxy collisions play? We think that's a, a major deal about how elliptical galaxies came about through uh, collisions of spirals, uh, how is the uh, chemical evolution of galaxies uh, uh, related to, uh, re related to the physical evolution, and um, uh, what's powering the light in the center of the galaxies, and how does that evolve with, with the stars? Does that get fainter over time, uh, or uh, does that track uh, how the stars' uh, lights evolve also? This is a picture here, sort of a sequence. This is a, this is a pretty mature galaxy. So about half the age of the universe, a uh, big pinwheel spiral like M51. A lot of you have looked at it, I'm sure, with uh, your telescopes. But they have a lot less structure and you go further back. And there's just been a lot less uh, dynamical time. So all these weird shapes and multiple nuclei. And we think that uh, you know, mergers could have uh, a pretty big uh, role there. These are, this is a simulation uh, where it's like a video game but with, with gravity turned on. So it's uh, 3D. Uh, each of those... Uh, uh, groups of stars, probably like uh, the tens of thousands of little particles that are self-gravitating, but then they interact with each other, and uh, when they collide, they will uh, 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 lose energy, and uh, usually a, a really big central object will form in the middle. That's how clusters of galaxies form. So people have figured out that much, but uh, we uh, need to validate this more and understand it better by pushing further back in time. Okay, so um, uh, these are some of the, the detailed questions from that. Oh, oops, some slides. Go on to the next one. Um, getting closer to home, we want to understand how stars form in our own galaxy. And uh, our galaxy is a great lab for stars. There are about four or five 
forming every year or so in uh, our galaxy. And uh, however, you know, the process takes a long time. It's hundreds of thousands of years. So there are a lot of different regions where you can see stars in various uh, states of formation. Uh, Orion is one of those regions. You look at the trapezium, you see all that dust there. Well, it turns out that hiding in that dust, there are a bunch of young stars. There are uh, also closer regions than Orion as well. And uh, that is really trying to diagnose what's going on uh, at, the, at, at sort of a cosmically, uh, uh, co cosmic now time. So not in the past, but uh, now. We have a cartoon scenario that uh, we've put together over time. This is from a uh, paper, uh, semi-popular article I published about 10 years ago in American Scientist showing that uh, there's a dark cloud and uh, we know these exist, like you, the pre trapezium in Orion. And uh, they, they get gravitationally unstable. There are little uh, interactions. And uh, at some point, gravity uh, outweighs the uh, internal uh, uh, pressure from, from the heat of the cloud. And it starts to collapse. And it looks like the first thing that forms, you get a little bit of a central object. And then a big disk forms around it because of uh, conservation of angular momentum. Stuff has a little bit of rotational energy. And when it uh, spirals into the center, it speeds up a lot. And it speeds up so much, it can't even fall onto the center. It uh, has too much rotational energy. But uh, if a bunch of this stuff falls in a disk, then the uh, rotational energy can dissipate, we think. And uh, jets will turn on at some point, just because not predicted, we just found them. Uh, and then this uh, cloud that, that formed in this co cloud core will go away somehow. We don't know whether the jets drive it away or what. And then the disks dissipate, you start seeing gaps in the disk. We've seen about 20 disks like this with Hubble, where uh, they have gaps, and now we're finding planets in some, like uh, you've seen some of the ground based planets for HR 8799, and we're left with a uh, planetary system. So. That's kind of our uh, cartoon idea, but in order to see this, we need to be able to peer through all this dust and uh, that's uh, around where these young stars are. So how do we do that? I mean, Hubble couldn't do it here because this is, this is the famous pillars of, uh, I think, the first wide field planetary camera, Hubble. And uh, this is a region where uh, high mass stars are forming. But uh, we can't really see what's going on inside of the dust, which is maybe where the youngest stars are. And then uh, you can only see these uh, formed stars. So uh, uh, however, if you look not in the visible, but in the infrared, it's the same field. And you see it's completely through the dust. You look at wavelengths like about four or five times longer. And uh, JWST T will actually go uh, longer than that. So, and uh, some of the brightest objects you see here, like this, are really the young stars. They're completely invisible in the previous picture. So need to go to uh, longer wavelengths with good resolution. And this sort of shows the importance of angular resolution. This is, uh, there, there's a class of stars, some of the youngest stars um, that we know of. They have uh, yet to uh, accumulate the majority of their mass. There are things that are going to be like the mass of the sun, but so far they've only accumulated 10% of the solar mass. And the rest of their mass is still in this cloud around them. So uh, we like to be able to uh, study these things. We have to be able to peer through the envelopes and see what's going on with the uh, uh, very young protostars and their disks and seeing what's going on. So if uh, we could take a whole field, whoops, if we could take a, a whole a spectrum at every point here, let's say, then we could understand, uh, you know, uh, get information from the central star and here, and then we'd see the jets. We'd see different lines coming out, different uh, atomic emissions from the jets, and you can see differences in the disk. Well, this is the field that we get from uh, the mid-infrared spectrograph on James Webb, and it pretty much covers that square there. So we'll be able to get a uh, spectrum at every point to uh, diagnose what's going on. Now, uh, also, uh, planets are forming around these young stars, and we want to understand that better, too. One of uh, uh, some key finds we found in uh, the late 90s, around the year 2000, was a European satellite that looked at some of these disks around uh, other solar systems. This is a great picture of a Fomalhaut. This is a Hubble picture down here on the, the bottom right. Let's see if I can uh, find uh, Mr. Mouse. So, uh, this is a ring at about 100 AU away from the star, so that's you know beyond the Kuiper belt uh, in this thing. And then uh, uh, we was always uh, postulated to be a planet here because the ring was sharp. Something is making the ring sharp, and lo and behold, it was found. There was some doubt about it for a while, but now it's back. People think it, it's real. 
Uh, people took some uh, infrared spectra of some of these disks, all this dust there. I mean, it's like uh, uh, we have a little dust in our solar system. This is like 1,000 or 10,000 times more. So those are the only ones we've been able to see so far. Because we're not sensitive enough. People can take, uh, took spectra with uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope and with this telescope called ISO, this, uh, Euro this uh, European one that uh, launched in the late 90s. And you get these characteristic peaks. And we found out that um, the uh, spectra uh, uh, around this uh, debris disk star was pretty similar to uh, Comet Hale Bopp in our own, own solar system. We've actually been able to identify some of these features uh, as being uh, uh, found, being due to minerals like forsterite, so uh, things that you can dig up on Earth. So it's uh, be kind of interesting to be able to do this for more kinds of objects and be able to uh, understand uh, if there are different populations of materials in some of these forming solar systems. We also want to characterize other planets. Uh, it's been one of the great uh, discoveries of modern astrophysics is the fact that uh, planets are very common around the stars. Kepler showed that uh, there's an average of about two planets around every star in our galaxy, just uh, going from the Kepler statistics. And the next step we want to do is be able to characterize their atmosphere. We're going to move from discovery to understanding, to characterization. And uh, if we take the light from uh, some of these transiting planets, the same technique that Kepler uses, we can dice it up and understand what uh, materials are in the atmosphere, understand the temperatures, and uh, from that, maybe understand a little bit of how they form, too. So, like, look at uh, uh, how much material is in the atmosphere, how, uh, what the fraction of uh, heavy elements is compared to the stars. And that tells us, like, uh, how they formed in a disk and how they accumulated matter. <coughs> With Hubble, we've been uh, arguing about whether these things even show absorptions. Uh, like, about uh, 2008, people started to get data, and some people saw things, some people said, oh, it was bogus. And uh, they've got a better instrument on Hubble now. It's actually starting to see water and, uh, car and uh, carbon monoxide have been identified, met methane maybe on some of these. But, I mean, it's just getting a very basic inventory. But we want to be able to do with Webb is look at a lot more of the spectrum. So this is the, what Hubble can see of about uh, one to two microns. So this is going to be about this region of the planet spectrum. With Webb, we can do this whole thing. And then this is a simulation that I did of, uh, for this one planet, showing uh, in a, just a single one of these transit events uh, what we can do. And the way this technique works is uh, there's a planet orbiting the star, and at some point uh, you just see the star, because the planet's dark, it's, it's not self-luminous, so we, we just can't see its light. Then the planet passes in front of the star, and we see the light sort of coming through the, uh, just the very exterior annulus of its atmosphere. And uh, just by looking at the difference, between when the planet is in front of the star and when it's not, then uh, you take a ratio and you can, you can actually see these features in the spectrum of the planet. And we can do that both for, uh, this, is, this is in transit, that's what this, this, this top one is, and also we can look at an emission. We can also look at the, the planet's light itself. When it's on this side, it's being illuminated by the star, and we can see the, and, and light from the star hits the surface of the planet, comes, comes to us. And uh, we can look at it before and after it goes behind the star. And then that difference is this bottom one, which shows the uh, actual, it's going up because the planet's cool. So longer wavelengths, it's brighter. And uh, that's the emission spectrum. So if we can do this for the same planets, we can actually get a lot of information. This is a uh, simulation, uh, a little more detail from the same planet, showing some of these uh, molecular transitions. Uh, you get them both in emission and absorption and probes different parts of the atmospheres. We'll be able to actually uh, measure uh, uh, the uh, temperature as a, as, as a function of altitude in the atmosphere of the planet and uh, be able to understand what's intrinsic to it, how much it's being influenced by a star, uh, what the compositions are, and how that relates to its own star. So that's some, um, so we've been working pretty intently, going to spend a few hundred hours right off the bat looking at a number of planets with this technique. I'm working with uh, Jonathan Fortney at uh, UC Santa Cruz who's been modeling these. So it's going to take a pretty, uh, uh, pretty fancy can opener to do all these observations, right? You know, the, uh, uh, it's not your garden variety uh, telescope. So uh, when you put all this together, it's going to uh, uh, require something that's going to be busy for about five or ten years, uh, just constantly taking data. And that's the uh, mission uh, lifetime requirement is five, hopefully we'll get 10. Uh, have a six and a half meter mirror, I'll show you some more details on that. 
uh, it'll be segmented, and I'll show you why. Uh, we uh, can't fit, there's no launch fairing big enough for a six and a half meter mirror is uh, one reason. Don't have a rocket big enough yet. Then um, uh, it's, since it's gonna work in the infrared, I showed you how we have to peer uh, through a lot of these dust clouds, and also you wanna look at the early universe, everything so heavily redshifted, it's gotta work at uh, much longer wavelengths. So Hubble, uh, Hubble's uh, instruments mostly are around where the eye can see, you can go a little factor two uh, shorter wavelengths, and the ultraviolet factor two longer in the infrared, but we wanna go like, uh, you know, uh, 10 times longer uh, wavelengths than what uh, Hubble can see. And uh, this, this thing will do that. And in order to do that, the telescope needs to be cold, uh, much colder than Hubble is, because uh, uh, it'll be sensitive to its own heat. And uh, as you go to these longer wavelengths, the infrared is uh, uh, produced by uh, anything with warmth. So you want a very cold object. So this thing's going to be put far away from Earth. It's going to not orbit Earth in a low Earth orbit like Hubble. Hubble's only like 200 miles, you know, uh, above the surface of the Earth. This thing's going to be a million miles away in an orbit that's on the other side of the moon. It's a stable point in the Earth-Sun-Moon system. There are already a few astrophysics observatories there, like uh, WMAP was there, Planck was there. And uh, let's see, uh, cold, I said. Uh, so it's gonna, the telescope's going to be around uh, 40 Kelvin. Uh, the instruments are going to be in the 30s. One of the instruments is going to be 6 Kelvin, so that's like 6 degrees above absolute zero. That's one that's sensitive to the longest wavelengths. And there'll be yeah, four of these instruments here They're going from uh, red in the visible. So uh, visible light's about uh, 0.55 microns. It's about, what we, it's about where the sun peaks and we see is green. And so we can see out to like... Uh, uh, I don't know, almost 0.8 uh, microns, 0.7 something, and, uh, uh, and it'll, it'll go out to 28 microns. And these instruments are going to do wide field imaging, but different filters, just like you do imaging with uh, your own telescopes. Then uh, spectroscopy to dice the light up to see what the constituents are. We'll have coronagraphs there, so you can blot out a bright star and look at a faint disk around it, or uh, uh, you could blot out the center of, a, of a, a very early universe object and see if there's a faint galaxy around it. And uh, this uh, aperture mask interferometry is for very high uh, spatial resolution. So clever. These, there are a lot of uh, uh, optics tricks that people play with this uh, non redundant mask. So it'll get very high spatial resolution. It's also going to be supremely sensitive. Uh, just to give you an idea, so uh, this is uh, sensitivity versus wavelength. Uh, so Hubble in the near infrared was about uh, here. Uh, James Webb is two orders of magnitude, so 100 times more sensitive to two microns. And uh, so that's uh, pretty significant because it takes, you have to square that to get the time. So it would take Hubble 10,000 times longer to reach the same sensitivity that James Webb will there. And then you see Hubble just goes away at longer wavelengths. Uh, Spitzer was a tiny space telescope, it was only uh, eight tenths of a meter, so it's about one tenth the size. And uh, so it's got about uh, one one hundredth the uh, sensitivity of uh, James Webb. It'll be quite powerful compared to uh, the ground. These are uh, uh, it's the Keck telescope now. It's the world's biggest and Gemini telescope. Then uh, you see that the sensitivity of, uh, of this is uh, for spectroscopy sensitivity of James Webb. Again, will be almost two orders of magnitude uh, better. So again, that's a factor of ten thousand. Generally, the rule of thumb for space is like, don't even think about launching something unless it's going to be a factor of 100 better than what you've got already from the ground because it's so difficult and expensive and time consuming. So this, I think, passes that bar, you know, when you start talking about doing things uh, 10,000 times faster. So why is a 10,000, why is a six and a half meter telescope in space going to do something 10,000 times faster than a bigger telescope on the ground? Well, it's uh, because this whole infrared thing where uh, the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere and the telescope are all emitting in the infrared. So this plot here sort of shows the background of uh, just uh, what's coming off of everything here on the Earth. And uh, uh, if you don't believe me, the Earth's radiating. So uh, go outside in the desert. You know, let's say we had a 10,000 foot mountain in the desert in uh, the middle of winter, and uh, see if you don't believe me. Then you know, wear a t-shirt. <laughs> yes, you know, you can definitely detect, uh, you know, uh, your body radiating all of your energy into space. <laughs> so uh, this shows that uh, James Webb, because it's going to be so cold, it's going to have a lot less of this thermal emission. So this is a 10 microns wavelength. 
So that's uh, like 20 times longer than the ICs. Just, you know, again, orders of magnitude uh, less radiation. And it will be completely uh, also much more sensitive than these 30 meter giant telescopes that people are, are uh, working on building on the ground as well. I'm going to start now talking a little bit about the hardware as to uh, what uh, makes this, what this thing is going to be made out of. This is actually a uh, uh, a scale model of it here. It's, it's been around the world. I think the last time I saw it was in uh, Ireland, it was in Dublin. But uh, it's been on the mall in Washington. That's in front of uh, building number eight, Goddard Space Flight Center. And these are all these people in front of it. So the, uh, we have a telescope. That's a big, important part, right? With the, the mirror as a secondary, like goes through the hole to the instruments. This is a big sunshade where the sun and the earth are always on the uh, hot part of it. And then the telescope is always on the cold part. And uh, so uh, this radiates off into space and uh, that's why it allows, it gets so cold. And this is a very uh, well insulating and reflective sunshade. This sort of gives you an idea of the scale of the mirror. So each segment is about uh, 1.3 uh, meters across, there are 18 segments. The Hubble telescope is a little bigger than uh, one of the segments, so it's a 2.4 meter uh, telescope. And uh, this has about seven times the area of uh, Hubble. Herschel was a far infrared telescope that uh, the Europeans flew. I think the uh, observatory ran it, 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 it completed its mission, it uh, ran out of cryogens. Then, uh, but this is even uh, bigger than that. So, um, this sort of gives you uh, an example of what we can do with the mirror. The mirror does two things. One is it gives uh, this tremendous light gathering power. And the other thing is that uh, it's diffraction limited. And there's no seeing problems in space. So, uh, you know, you can get very sharp images. This is uh, what the Spitzer telescope saw in the very deep early universe uh, image in the, far in, in, the, in the middle of infrared. And it was limited in resolution by its 0.8 meter mirror. So, you know, uh, uh, that's something like uh, uh, 30 inches in diameter, 0.85. And then, but Webb, for the same field, will probably show something like this, just to give you an idea. So, uh, uh, by the greater sensitivity and the spatial resolution, you know, we'll just get a much better view than anything we've had. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you got to fit this thing on a rocket, and uh, the way you're going to do that is that uh, there are going to be wings with uh, three segments each on that fold away, and the whole secondary folds away. We can uh, show you a little bit in the next slide. Uh, it's going to launch an Ariane 5, one of the most reliable, maybe the most reliable rocket uh, ever. And uh, this is uh, part of the European contribution. It's going to launch out of French Guiana. So uh, uh, they're a little different with the launches. They don't have a lot of people coming down there, so I have to watch it launch remotely. And it's going to launch warm and cool as it uh, goes to its uh, to its final orbit. It's going to weigh about six tons. Okay, six point three metric tons, which is pretty astounding when you uh, think about it. This is uh, how it's going to fold up in the fairing. So uh, uh, quite impressive, and. Uh, I can show this. This picture was taken in the last month of them uh, doing, uh, this is a mock-up. So this is uh, the telescope uh, on its side here, and they're unfolding the uh, uh, secondary uh, deployment mechanism here. So it was folded back over there, just like it was in this uh, previous picture. Where was it located? Uh, it's going to be at the, the, where the telescope will be located. Well, or, well where or, is, yeah, where uh, this, this facility? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, in, in gas, north of Grumman uh, Aerospace Systems down in Redondo Beach. Used to be TRW. Is that where the telescope's going to be too? Um, well, it'll find, I think it's going to be, it will be finally integrated there. But I'll show you some, some stuff about integration and test and, and where it's all going to be put together. The, uh, it's a very common garden variety telescope. I'm sure just like you all have uh, beryllium uh, materials with gold coatings. <laughs> right? That's now all your backyard telescopes. So, uh, yeah, so beryllium is a really funny material. Uh, first off, it's toxic, uh, so it's difficult to work with. You uh, actually press it from a powder. So, uh, I guess when it gets mined, they crush it up to a powder and then they press it into uh, a substrate and they polish the substrate. These mirrors 
Um, these 18 segments were polished right across the bay in Richmond. At, uh, Tinsley has a facility. They built a building just for James Webb. And they learned how to handle beryllium. They'd actually made the beryllium 0.8 meter uh, Spitzer telescopes. They're natural candidates for that. And uh, then they were tested. I'll show you a picture of that at uh, these low temperatures uh, at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. So it turns out, you know, you got to keep. It's important to keep your weight down, especially if you're going into space, right? And that's why it has. That's why it uses beryllium. Beryllium is about. Uh, seven times the uh, uh, lighter than aluminum for the same stiffness. So that's why it's worthwhile going on it. So the uh, primary, secondary, tertiary mirrors are all going to be brilliant. This is uh, just, this is not, this is just a small mirror that's, uh, that's been, that, that, that gets moved quickly. Um, one of our instruments that we made, uh, NERCAM, which we made at Lockheed, had to be beryllium too, just because not only a mass, but also just for the center of mass issues and where it was. So uh, uh, it's a tricky and difficult material, but uh, this sort of shows uh, how it pays off. So as I mentioned, the uh, uh, stiffness to mass ratio is seven times that of aluminum. It's very highly conductive thermally, which is good. You don't want to have temperature gradients across it. The uh, low coefficient of thermal expansion, again, if there is any temperature gradient, you don't want to like uh, have the mirror warp if one side's a little uh, warmer than the other. Then uh, this kind of gives you an idea. So these segments are 1.3 meters across, uh, weighs 22 kilograms for the segment. So that's less than 50 pounds. How many like 1.3 meter mirrors do you know of that are you know, optically sound? weigh less than 50 pounds. So, and then with the full assembly, it's about 40 kilograms. That's with all the actuators on it to be able to do the tip and tilt and piston because we'll be able to have to align all these things. So the density is 28 kilograms per square meter. Keck Observatory in Hawaii is uh, almost 100 times more than that. And it's a lightweight telescope by ground telescope standards. And uh, Hubble is uh, you know, uh, about a factor of uh, six. Uh, um, worse than that too. So, you know, if you want to, uh, we had to go to this and uh, the payoff is you can uh, actually uh, launch a big telescope. Because if we use the Hubble technology, you know, you can't just, we, we, could, we couldn't really launch it to uh, uh, anything bigger than what we already have. This shows uh, some of the segments being tested in this big vacuum chamber. This is actually a cryogenic chamber at Marshall Space Flight Center. They could do one, two, three, four, six at a time. And they put them on this cart, and then uh, so uh, Tinsley made them, and they uh, actually computed how they would distort when they got cold, and they put in errors in the polishing. Uh, they measured when it was warm, thinking <coughs> that it would be correct when it got cold. So then they actually cooled them in this chamber in uh, in Alabama, and then measured them. And then if they had to do any touch-ups, they did them. But I think that uh, uh, Tinsley got the process down pretty well, and they had very minimal touch-ups of the of the figuring. Yes. Yeah. So. Are they doing anything special to avoid like another Hubble debacle? Yeah, 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 I'll show you that. Hubble grinding across the mirror to well, the perfect wrong curve. Yeah, well, what <laughs> Hubble didn't do, or actually they did, they did several end-to-end -end tests. They just didn't believe the critical one. So it's important to have bring light through and all the way uh, and all the way through the telescope. Now that's a lot easier for Hubble than this thing because Hubble is a room temperature telescope. It's got heaters on it. It's flying in low Earth orbit. It's 70 degrees, perfectly balmy. You know, you can just put it there in your test chamber and have the whole thing working. With this, you have stuff that's got to be you know six degrees Kelvin, and you got stuff like not too far away. It's got to be 300 degrees Kelvin. We can't do that environmentally with the whole thing, but we can uh, we can get close. So I'll try to show what, what we're doing there. Um, all the mirror segments are delivered. Those are very nice little uh, uh, shipping containers. Each one had a mirror segment. There are three prescriptions on the mirrors. You see that A, B, C. Those are the three different figures that they have, and, and laying them out around the uh, uh, center. So I think that's and this is uh, there's a I'm not sure where that one is. That's Probably not the big clean room at Goddard. That, the, the big clean room at Goddard is bigger than that. That, that may be at Ball Aerospace somewhere. So uh, the sunshade really has uh, really really has a, a, a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, ten to six uh, uh, sun protection factor. So this is the um, uh, schematic down in the bottom right. So this is the side that's always facing the sun and the earth. It's got the communications, solar panels for uh, for power. And uh, then all that light has to get blocked 
because this has got to be able to get really cold and radiate all of its heat off to space and down to like 40 Kelvin. So uh, there are five layers, and they're separated out. You can see there's some gaps between the layers to allow uh, radiation to get out, uh, made of this reflective capton material. The uh, surface can get uh, pretty hot, and then, but the backside has to be less than 100 Kelvin. This is a very flight-like uh, full-size build of it. This is uh, um, made just as how the uh, flight one will be made. It just, uh, the contamination hasn't been controlled. So they made it, and they're, you know, putting it together and uh, just, you know, kind of checking out processes for uh, assembly on this. So I think this is also taken in the last month. Notice that uh, that's a person there. So uh, the telescope is going to fill that whole area there. And uh, that's uh, the, all the different layers uh, uh, deployed. Okay, so um, we got the telescope covered, but we're also going to need some instruments. Going to need to uh, detect the light that the telescope gathers. So there are four science instruments, and uh, this one is going to be the heart of the telescope. It's going. It has the most pixels. It has ten uh, near infrared detectors. Uh, each one's got four million pixels, so it's got forty megapixel camera, and uh, which doesn't sound like a lot compared to some, you know, even digital cameras these days, but uh, the trick is that it works with these much longer wavelengths than uh, traditional detectors do in, in our cameras. So uh, getting uh, uh, detectors with uh, that many pixels is kind of a big deal. It's uh, going to be taking the primary images of the telescope, and it's also going to be used for phasing the, the mirror segments, for uh, doing all sorts of wavefront control tricks. And then we have, uh, to complement the camera, there's a spectrograph that's going to work from visible light also out to uh, 5 microns. And uh, this is, uh, I'll show you some more of it, but uh, it will dice the light up and be able to figure out what some of the elements are. And we've got a mid-infrared instrument that goes at much longer wavelengths, and it's going to both take pictures and do spectra. So it's got uh, capabilities of both. Its detector isn't as big, though, so it's not a, a big mapping thing like NERCAM. And uh, there's this other one that's part of the guider. The, the, the also need a guide camera, right? Because all of you with telescopes know when you're imaging, you need to guide because uh, if you don't, things are going to drift away. And um, even just the sunlight pressure on this thing is, uh, is a pretty big deal. There's even a trim tab on the sun, sunshade because it, it works as a solar sail. So uh, this, this is, there's a guider, and also it's got some scientific capability, too. It's going to do some uh, spectroscopy. Some pictures of the near-infrared camera. There are uh, actually two totally identical modules uh, here and here. Some little parts are swapped left and right, and then they're, uh, they're, they're, on, they're on benches. The, the benches get bolted to, uh, to each other. So uh, it's very redundant. So uh, you know, if uh, one part fails, uh, you still have a whole other side. Then uh, University of Marshariki at the University of Arizona is a principal investigator built at Lockheed Martin across the way. Uh, sees about... Uh, each, each module sees two by two arc minutes, and there are two of them, so you get about two, two by four uh, square arc minutes. So it's not a huge field, but uh, you know, uh, quite uh, big enough to see a, 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 a part of a cluster of stars, see uh, a lot of a, uh, a planetary nebula. Then uh, the spatial resolution is quite good in the near infrared. So uh, each pixel is uh, at, at two microns is 32 milli arc seconds. Right, so that means you're going to get so the resolution element is two pixels, so you're going to get uh, uh, something like uh, uh, 15 resolution elements within an arc second. So uh, pretty high resolution. Uh, it's going to be uh, better than uh, what most of the really large telescopes could do on the ground, even with adaptive optics. And then, uh, like most of the instruments here, it uses these uh, mercury, cadmium, tellurium detectors. Uh, each one's 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, and there are 10 of them, and uh, operates at 40 Kelvin. The uh, light comes in here, hits this, uh, this is a focus mirror, then uh, just hits a fold mirror here. This is a uh, uh, collimating mirror, goes into a beam splitter, long wavelength light goes here, goes through a filter wheel, so you pick your filters, and then there's a camera that uh, focuses it on the detector, and the short wavelength light hits the beam splitter and focuses and, and reflects off the front, goes through another filter wheel, and uh, then the uh, camera focuses it onto the shortwave detector. And uh, so you can do long and short wavelengths at the same time. 
And again, there are two of these identical modules, so you can do two different areas at the same time. This is a picture of the two modules put together, uh, back to back here. So this, that's, that's the actual flight hardware there. These legs aren't, these legs are just uh, uh, a uh, ground support equipment, test equipment. This is uh, when we were testing it over at Lockheed in their uh, test chamber. So and that one, again, has got a brilliant bench. The uh, Europeans built a uh, uh, near infrared spectrograph, same wavelengths, and what this one's going to do, instead of taking pictures, it will uh, dice the light up and uh, get spectra of objects. It's made out of silicon carbide, the, uh, another, you know, not really traditional optical material that we would think of. Uh, Euro Europeans and Germans and French, they've figured out uh, silicon carbide better than we have over here in the U.S., but uh, they've, uh, they've been um, making a few mirrors with it, and uh, it's also a very lightweight, stiff material. So uh, one nice trick that this thing does is that uh, it, uh, uh, light will come in from the telescope and uh, get focused, and in the focal plane, there's this thing called a micro shutter array. It's kind of tricky. So this is made with like microelectronics techniques. Each one of uh, these, uh, so it, there's something like uh, you know 400 of these uh, little cells in each of these. So there are about 1,600 of these uh, little shutter cells, and each one's about uh, 100 microns in size. They they can be controlled individually, so you can open it or close it. So uh, when this is in a focal plane, you can, uh, if they're all closed, you don't see anything in the detector, right? So it's all blocked, and then no light gets to the detector here. Now, uh, if you open one, then uh, light will go through that one, and it gets dispersed by uh, a prism or a grating, and you get a little spectrum where that one uh, open shutter was. So uh, uh, you can open uh, various ones in the field to make sure your spectra don't overlap with each other. So if you take a picture, you find a bunch of galaxies, and you say, I want to get a spectrum of this, this, and this, and this, and you open the shutters, and uh, you collect the spectrum. So you get multiple objects at the same time. Wow. So it's, uh, it's quite a cool trick. Uh, people on the ground do this, but it's usually a more of a brute force technique where you have to take a picture months in advance, and then they actually take a metal plate and they laser etch holes in it, and then you have to throw the plate into your instrument. So we don't have anybody up there, you know, it costs too much, you know, and you have to send food and pizzas up. So we thought it'd be easier to do this for, uh, for James Webb. And uh, again, uses these fancy uh, Mercad tellurium detectors, and uh, there's sort of two next to each other where we can uh, disperse the light. There's some other, uh, there's some other uh, spectrographic capabilities as well. It's pretty big. You know, so it's uh, maybe uh, twice the area of an air camp. So, and those are uh, the technicians uh, working on it. You, sometimes you just need the size to uh, disperse the light and you've got a lot of fuel like that. There's also the mid-infrared instrument. This is a consortium of uh, uh, Euro 10 European countries, which is just one person put together and they deliver their half to ESA and then the European Space Agency and then uh, NASA did the detectors in the electronics. So it's a, it's a joint uh, uh, project made out of uh, aluminium and uh, will have filters in it and uh, uh, with a little smaller field of a couple square arc minutes and be able to also do spectroscopy so uh, at a couple different resolutions and will be able to actually get spectra at uh, individual points. This is it sitting in its uh, blanket. See, these, uh, these legs here are black. And you saw in the NERCAM one, those legs were silver, even though those weren't quite light. So that's because these are non-conductive. Uh, these are uh, uh, carbon fiber legs to uh, isolate it thermally, because this thing has to be cooled by a cooler down to only 6 degrees Kelvin, or 6.5 degrees Kelvin. And that's the whole instrument. And there it's wrapped in a thermal blanket to uh, uh, reduce the heat load on it. Are you going to have a refrigerator in a spacecraft? Yeah, there's there is a, a two-stage cooler. It's a it's a Sterling cycle and a Joule Thompson cooler. Yeah, so uh, it doesn't use any uh, consumables though. They're closed. They're closed cycles. So hopefully uh, it'll it'll last for the mission. And then uh, there's Mary again. This is uh, the the imager part is actually pretty small. It's like uh, this part here, but this is all part of the spectrograph. This uh, interval field spectrograph. So this is what the imager field looks like. We, uh, uh, the, the main open square there is where we'll take pictures of things. Um, here, where you see this little, whoops. No, 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 okay. Here's my pointer. 
So uh, this little green thing there, that's a slit where we could put, uh, uh, use it as a spectrograph, a low resolution spectrograph. And then those four squares on the uh, side, these are all coronagraphic masks where you could put the uh, a bright star like uh, in the center of one of these things, like there, and it blocks out the, the bright star and you can see faint stuff around it is the idea. And then, so that one works classically. The other ones use this, uh, uh, these four quadrant uh, phase techniques where you can actually see much closer in to the bright star. Then uh, this is what the spectrograph sees is there's a separate aperture for a, for a high resolution spectrograph. And uh, it, it looks at a little square that's about this big or so you know, uh, relative to the imaging field. And it takes every little pixel in there and gets a spectrum of it. So that's what you're seeing there. And then this is a, a, a picture of uh, uh, the point source uh, of the telescope. It's gonna look like that. So we uh, uh, have a telescope simulator. It's up in the top right. And then uh, the guider is made out of uh, aluminum, I think. And uh, same story, uh, near-infrared detectors like uh, NERDCAM and NERSPEC. And uh, it's got, uh, it'll, its job is to uh, guide the telescope. And it also has some uh, slitless uh, grisms for uh, looking at early universe objects or early emission line objects. And also um, looking for uh, these uh, exoplanet transits. Some that example I showed you of being able to take the spectra of uh, some of these planets around other stars. And that's the actual flight article. It's been at Goddard for a few years. Now, what's happened lately is we put all these together, and uh, the uh, cello case over here on the side, or it's, it's more like a base case, that's the NERSPEC <laughs> instrument. NERCAM is there, and then MIRI's here, Guider's back there. So uh, you're looking at about a billion dollars there. And, uh, you know, this is, so this is all together now, and uh, we tested them in April, uh, warm, and uh, everything worked, and so we, we had, it turns out the techs had, uh, had broken a cable for Miri, but uh, we replaced that. And now they're being tested in this huge chamber that uh, simulates the cold of space. There's a simulated telescope in here. That's this thing called OSIM that uh, sits under the instruments. This, this thing, ISIM, is where the instruments are integrated science instrument module. All the instruments are in here. This simulates the James Webb telescope. This is at about 40 degrees Kelvin right now. And the uh, Miri in there is, is colder, so uh, and it's you know ambient temperature, oops, ambient temperature right out here, and then there's just these uh, uh, walls with uh, that are that are cooled inside. There's a vacuum cold. So this is that uh, the instruments being lowered down into the top of that tank. This gives you an idea of the scale. These are people there. So this thing's coming down from uh, from above. Then uh, if you thought that was big, the whole telescope is going to be put into a bigger chamber. So, so we're testing these instruments uh, through the summer, through September. I think Linda mentioned I've been part of this. I'm going to actually go back on Sunday and uh, working on the two that I'm, that I'm on. Then uh, probably in about two years, uh, we're going to put the whole telescope in this chamber at Johnson Space Flight Center. So this chamber was made for people to practice, simulate, driving around on the moon. Okay, so big vacuum chamber, the astronauts were in there, all suited up, you know, probably lots of dust in there. Hopefully they clean all the dust out, right? <laughs> and, uh, here we have the, uh, the telescope looking up, and we have a bunch of light sources up here. So we will be able to get light in to uh, hit the mirror, and then uh, hit the secondary, go through, get detected with the instrument. So we will do sort of an end-to-end -end test to avoid the Hubble debacle. Right, we don't want another one of those because at least with the Hubble, we can go there and fix it. With this thing, we can't go there. You know, it's uh, once it leaves this Earth, it is on its own. Now, how is it going to get around? Well, it's got a pretty fancy ride. It's got an email saying I can't park my car behind the building at Goddard where because this thing is, is going to be there tomorrow. And uh, so the whole telescope, and we'll go in there, and uh, um, this. Section here is pulled around by a uh, by a big rig, and you can see it barely uh, fits into this transport aircraft. So that will be the telescope all folded up with the instruments on it, and uh, that's probably how they're going to get everything over to Northrop Grumman, where it's going to get integrated to spacecraft, and then to, and then get it down to uh, South America. Okay, and then so this uh, sort of shows we'll be using the uh, Deep Space Network uh, to communicate uh, after. Uh, the mission is launched, and uh, some details here about uh, the uh, data links. So those are uh, pretty, pretty 
move the data rates. So uh, uh, actually, the uh, yeah, this is uh, I thought where you had like a megabit per second uh, data link. Anyway, this sort of shows the orbit in uh, time. It's going to take off and uh, just do a straight injection, not going to orbit the Earth or anything like that. It's going to take off and go. So uh, after 15 hours, do a little uh, correction for its course, then uh, deploy the uh, sunshade after two days. That's going to be a big one. And then de deploy the telescope, which is going to be a big one. It's got to unfold, and that secondary has to come out. And uh, then uh, it's going to take a while for uh, it to actually, like a couple months, to get into uh, a, a fairly uh, circular L2 orbit here. So this is this point here in the uh, Earth-Moon-Sun system. It's about to scale. It's about four times further away than the uh, Moon is. And it just happens to be a stable point. And then there, we have other spacecraft uh, uh, operating there. So we're uh, getting close to the end of the talk, but there's a lot of material out there on a lot of websites. More will be coming. There are even little videos of, uh, of putting that, uh, all those, those instruments down into the chamber and moving them moving down the hall. There's a webcam where you can see activity on uh, the telescope part being built up. These, these books are available on the science that uh, Space Science Reviews. That's uh, uh, online. And uh, then this, this guide is available. Uh, websites are uh, both uh, uh, NASA and the Space Telescope Science Institute. They're going to... Uh, uh, Operate, and I uh, thought I'd end with uh, with this one in case you haven't seen it before. So it is going to launch on one fine day in 2018. <laughs> and uh, this will just uh, demonstrate a little bit some of that uh, launch and deployment sequence. It's a uh, it's a uh, a lot of moving parts, something you appreciate more when you actually watch this. So that's after it's ejected the fairing. So it was packed in there pretty tightly. First thing that goes out are the solar arrays because it's got to get power. Then it has to communicate with the Earth, so it moves the antenna. Then uh, before the telescope come out, you have to deploy the sunshade. And you've got to do that to uh, start cooling it off. Those things, those little legs that pull down are the spreaders that help spread the different layers because they're all stacked together in the fairing. All right, and then that's spreading the sunshade out. Whoa. Just a few moving parts. <laughs> See, I like how the telescope is on that spring and it kind of pops up. And now the Secondary deploys. Yeah, hopefully stops. And the wings go in, go in place. And then hopefully we uh, it cools off. We start taking our commissioning uh, data, start uh, getting getting it focused and doing wavefront control on the images, seeing what the real backgrounds are like. Yeah, this one's not to scale. It's not that much further from the Earth and the Moon, but it uh, sort of shows its, uh, its location there. This Lagrange point is the point that forms an equilateral triangle with the, uh, with the Earth and the Sun. No, no, that's, uh, that's uh, L3, L4, and L5. This is L2. It's on the, it's, it's, uh, on the other side of uh, the Moon from the Earth. It's on the other side of the Earth's orbit from, from uh, the sun. There's a point, there's a branch L1 is about 1% of the distance between the uh, Earth and the sun. That's where you can think about where the gravity is yeah. about balancing. Yeah. But there's a corresponding point on the other side of the Earth. On the sun? The other side of the Earth. So, oh, okay. so, so you have the sun, Earth, L2 is you know further from the sun than the Earth is. And that's a stable point. All right. So happy to. Uh, so that's that's it for the talk. Happy to. Uh, <laughs>
thing so that your pointer is either much larger or much brighter. It was really hard to follow. Yeah, yeah, we had a laser pointer failure. That was yes. uh, the uh, backup. Sorry about that. Okay. I, I couldn't see it either. <laughs> yes. I know that an infrared is the main thrust of the James Webb telescope, but is this thing going to be able to deliver some gorgeous visual light photos? Well, why do you want them in visual light? As long as they're gorgeous photos. Well, that's true. Right? You know, so well, think of it. Um, so we've got about three times the um, uh, diameter than the Hubble, right? And uh, so if we observe at three times the wavelength, we'll have the same uh, sharpness. So let's call that, you know? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. How, how cold is the coldest space out there, and how did you... You know, presumably it fluctuates when the sun's on it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, so how cold is it out there? Anyway? What's your starting point for cooling? It? Well, well, uh, the the the, co the the coldest thing that we can see is, uh, and it's everywhere, is the uh, cosmic microwave background, and it's about three degrees Kelvin, two point seven degrees Kelvin, and it's uh, pretty uniform. So the telescope can cool, you know, because uh, that's what it mostly sees. Uh, yes. Uh, what type of redundancy is there in case something goes wrong? Well, um, the spacecraft has uh, two sets of electronics, so uh, the multiple instruments, like you saw with NERCAM, we even have two separate halves of instruments. So this is a Class A mission. There, NASA has different classes of uh, redundancy required depending on how important the mission is. Whereas like the little more simple things or these class D where you can, it's okay to have single, called single string non-redundant stuff for, uh, but this thing is, is pretty redundant. Although, you know, there's only one mirror, but you know, we have multiple segments. You can, if the wing doesn't deploy, you can tip the segments out of the way. So uh, there are a few critical things, but uh, you know, they've been tested pretty hard. Yes? What kind of latency is at L2? Is that a quick? Or does it even matter, I suppose? Oh, good question. Yeah, like, uh, uh, well, the, the moon is about two seconds. Is that right? And uh, this is, uh, let's see, about, uh, uh, it's about four times further than the moon. It's about eight seconds, so it's not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Yes, in the back. So the telescope needs to always be on the opposite side of the sunshade. Yes. So can only observe a given object at a particular time during the year. Yes. Is the telescope going to have any permanent blind spots in the sky? No. Uh, you will be able to observe some parts of the sky more than others. So yeah, so uh, just because of the geometry, you know, as the Earth goes around uh, the sun, the you can always observe like the ecliptic poles, right? You can always rotate and look north or south. So those will have the best coverage. And uh, you know, if you have some object, it can observe uh, any, any spot in the sky, at least for like two months of the year, as it uh, goes around. It has enough tilt, you know, on its uh, uh, relative to the shade to do that, to, to, towards and away from the sun. Uh, yes? Back. Yeah, you mentioned uh, working with uh, wavefront activity. Sounded like you're talking about a phased array, is that correct? Um, it's not a, f well, the, the, yes, the segments of the mirror have to all be phased relative to each other. And uh, we have these uh, different elements in the camera where we can actually uh, look at how one segment is uh, positioned relative to another, and we can tweak the. We can tweak that. Oh, okay. So that's just for a clean wavefront. Right. You have a clean wavefront, so we get a. Uh, so we actually get a coherent wavefront across the full six and a half meters. So all those segments function as a single larger uh, telescope. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, I wanted to follow up on an earlier question. Uh, and we got to uh, a resolution uh, depending on the wavelength being mm -hmm. observed. Now, near the, uh, uh, the longer wavelength, uh, like five mm -hmm. uh, microns, mm -hmm. uh, that would be uh, like, what, what would be the, um, um, the resolution as far as like a uh, fraction of a wavelength? Uh, now, for instance, um, a optical telescope, if you have one eighth of a wave, mm -hmm. that would be considered uh, excellent. But with the web, uh, it's really going to be more for for uh, infrared. So toward the visual range, you, you're 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 only going to have maybe um, let's say much less than one eighth of a wave. Right. We'll be much more diffraction limited at longer wavelengths. We're going to have. I think the spec is 
like 150 nanometers of wavefront error. We think there's probably going to be well under 100 nanometers of wavefront error. So it'll be, uh, you know, let's, if we get, say we get out of 70 uh, nanometers of wavefront error, it's going to be lambda over 10 at uh, 700 nanometers wavelength. And then uh, if you go to 10 times longer wavelengths, then it's lambda over 100. So it will be pretty diffraction limited uh, down to uh, almost a micron in wavelength. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, could you just go back to the slide that mm -hmm. had all the different uh, like things to look at? And... Yeah, that one. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah I can keep that up here. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, right. But uh, Google is your friend. You know, there's a you know, tremendous amount. And I mean, that's where we get it from, too, right? Because you don't know who else wants to do stuff. <laughs> yes? Do well, you have these slides available anywhere online? So um, they're pretty big. Uh, I could look into putting them somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody uh, pings me, I could put them on a uh, on like a, a, a Google Docs page or something like that. If, if, if this recording works, we'll have them online, okay. so Great. you can check our website. Okay. Yes. The mirror is once deployed, it's pretty unprotected. <coughs> Well, there's a reason why that sunshade's got five layers. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, little micrometeorites are going to come whizzing right through there. So, uh, you know, yeah, we could, it's got some area. We could take a hit, too. You know, I can lose, lose a little bit of area. But yeah, the emissivity's going to go up. You know, stuff's going to hit it, and it's not going to be as reflective. So, uh, but that's into, uh, we have predictions for beginning of life and end of life for sensitivity and, uh, and, and for how well the sunshade's going to work and all that stuff, too. So people have thought of that. Yes? This is probably an obvious question for telescope knowledge people, but why is there not a like a cone around it, not a cone, a cylinder around it, like the Hubble and the, the Yeah, yeah, the baffle. Well, yeah, it's uh, that's caused a lot of problems because now there are all these possible rogue paths. I mean, if we had a cylinder around it, that would, that would be great. But um, uh, we want it to be cold, right? So that's going to keep it from getting cold. You know, uh, we'd have to refrigerate it or something because there's nothing better than the cold of space for it to see and, and radiate to. You know, and uh, also it's going to add mass, so we have to make the telescope smaller to get it all to fit and all that stuff. So, you know, the, the idea was to get it to work like this as best we could. There, there are a few, there are a few uh, concessions. We saw this little snout that comes up from the center where there's uh, that, that works a little bit like a baffle. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, how do you, uh, when you're pointing at something, mm -hmm. is it the spacecraft that gets pointed at it, or does it have some kind of other motion? Yeah, it's um, a full body pointing. Yes, the spacecraft gets pointed. And it could point to seven one thousandths of an arc second. That's the spec. We all paid a lot of money for that. <laughs> yes, in the back. Uh, when you said this telescope will focus on objects 10,000 times faster than the Hubble? Yeah, it can accumulate the same signal to noise, yeah. Well, it depends, you know, like if you spend, uh, this is also at some wavelengths. Now, if you get shorter wavelengths, it's not going to be that big of an improvement over the Hubble. But let's say, say two microns and longer. Uh, so like some of these fields, Hubble spent 10 days on, like, and it could only see, uh, you know, galaxies some distance away. And if we spent 10 days on that, we can see much further, or else we could spend, you know, 10,000 times less than 10 days. So that's one one uh, thousandth of a day. And we'll get to the same uh, limits of the Hubble did. So that's just the way to think about that. Yes? Um, given the performance of this uh, instrument, is there any role for um, supercritical resolution techniques to be applied here? That's what uh, we do have this one uh, uh, non redundant mask in the, uh, in the guider. It's, uh, what it does is uh, it uses only a fraction of the aperture, but it, it creates a lot of little baselines. It makes a little interferometer. So it actually resolves within the point spread function of the telescope. So uh, that's, that, will, that, that will be uh, a good way to get uh, really high resolution. Is it a standard grading, or is it made specifically? Oh, the gratings, yeah. So actually, I had one of the gratings made for the near-infrared camera. They call it a camera, right? But uh, we, we slipped in some grisms. Uh, well, uh, how standard is silicon? 
for yeah, grading. I mean, you're dealing with the infrared, right? You can't. The, the way these gratings are made is that uh, usually it's uh, a replica um, to, and then uh, some kind of resin, right? Well, the resins all uh, absorb and molecular bands, which is what we're trying to see. You know, at like three mi three microns, all these hydrocarbons and stuff. So we have to use different materials. So uh, the uh, um, so there are, there's some glasses. There's some. Uh, uh, germanium and uh, zinc sulfide and miri, you know, because they have to transmit these weird wavelengths. And then also you have to worry about, one thing I appreciated was that you have to look at response to radiation. I mean, because you're outside of the Earth's radiation belts, there are all these high-energy protons coming in, and a lot of glasses will get darkened and stuff like that. Silicon's a pretty hard material, so uh, that's what uh, we use for, uh, for some of the optics. Yes? It sounds like you're be part of the observer team rather than a theorist. Yes. And so what is your project, if you can say, that you're going to be observing with this? Yeah, I've got a few projects. Uh, one is to study the atmospheres of other planets through that technique of transits. So those are some simulations mm. I've been working on with some theorists because we want to figure out the best ones to observe and what we can learn. And also uh, really young stars like uh, the sun, but uh, back when they're only like 10% of uh, the mass, so they're still accumulating mass, we just can't penetrate very well. I mean, I got some Keck data from uh, a month ago where I can maybe look at the very brightest one, start to see a little bit of uh, the spectrum to understand the uh, temperature of the central object, uh, you know, how it's arranged itself, what kind of gravity it has, and that sort of thing. So this thing will be able to do that much better. So then we could expect you back here in a few years to tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm happy to come back uh, to tell you also about the launch and some results as well. But there'll be a lot of people uh, getting results. Okay. Yes. There's a, a book that probably a lot of people here read when they were kids called The Glass Giant of Palomar. Oh, and yeah. in that oh, yeah. book, there is a, a quite a, a section that explains why the Schmidt telescopes were built before the 200-inch telescope. In, other words, in, in fact, I think it went so far as to say that the 200-inch telescope would be like a blind man stumbling around hmm. without the Schmidt telescope to, to guide it. But I know in, in uh, space astronomy, no wide-angle space telescope has been built, though I suppose they've been pro proposed. What is what is the story on, on that? That's a great question. Yeah, we got it backwards. <laughs> I'll admit. Uh, yeah, ultimately, well, it depends what you want to do. You know, uh, um, this thing will have to probably uh, create, have to find some of the objects in itself. It'd be nice if there was something else out there. However, the thing is, if you do a big wide angle thing like Schmidt, it's not going to have the same sensitivity of, uh, of, uh, of, of this thing will. So um, we do have one plan for uh, the next decade. Uh, actually, we're supposed to have done it this decade, but we're a little behind. Uh, it's called W First. It's in the decadal survey. Uh, it's basically going to be a Hubble-sized uh, mirror, but each picture is going to have, be 300 times bigger than a Hubble field. And that's just going to be amazing. And it's going to work in the near infrared like this. So yeah, it would be great to have that thing up first. But uh, just the way this worked out is uh, 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 we went to something with uh, smaller fields first. One problem was is that we just didn't have the detectors uh, you know, 10 years ago that we could have made a really wide field. With the Schmidt telescope, it's easy. You have photographic plates, right? You just make the emulsion bigger. So we needed to have uh, a wide field infrared telescope. You need to have these detectors, and we needed to make the James Webb detectors in order to be able to scale up to something like that. Is that Schmidt telescope going to the Lagrange point? Also? It's actually, it's not a Schmidt. It's a, it's a similar function with a really wide field. Uh, actually, its field is going to be uh, uh, bigger than the full moon. To give you an idea, so it's smaller than Kepler. Kepler is actually a Schmidt. So, uh, but this will actually. Well, that's a good question. I would. We would very much like it to go to the Lagrange point, but uh, see who's in the room. Uh, sort of being <laughs> shoved down our throats a bit to go into a geosynchronous orbit from Earth, because some people think there's going to be a commercial market for uh, servicing satellites in geosynchronous orbit with robots. So the robot is going to go up to a communication satellite and say, oh, you're out of fuel. Let's give you some fuel and get it going. So uh, it'd be nice if this worked out for astronomy because then instead, because we're not going to have space shuttles, and we can send a robot up there to switch out instruments and stuff. So we're looking at uh, geosynchronous for that, but L2 would be better. Yes? Uh, I'm a 
So are you going to be able to send a robot up to the web and give it a little more fuel at some point? <laughs> uh, no, I think the answer is no. Uh, at some point, we're forced to actually put a grappling fixture onto it. But, uh, you know, if a spacecraft even got close to it, I mean, you, you really don't want to get on the cold side of it because any kind of gas that the spacecraft emits is going to freeze out on the mirror and be bad stuff. Yes? Oh, uh, in, in addition to observing the very distant universe, would the uh, JWS uh, have any uh, uh, value in observing uh, uh, optics in our own solar system? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I've been working with somebody who's got a really good idea for that. Like, uh, we don't really know the size of the Kuiper Belt objects. You know, uh, we know there's a population out there, and uh, but you can just measure the brightness, right? And in order to measure the size, you've got to measure the brightness, because you want to know is like, uh, how much visible light, what's the reflectivity? So uh, you can, so we're, we're measuring the visible light, but if you measure the infrared, that's a much better probe of the total amount of material there, because everything has to be emitted in the infrared. And the ratio gives you uh, the visible reflectance, the albedo. So not only that will uh, tell us the size, but we'll also get some idea as to how dark the surface is, and maybe some ideas about the surface. So uh, uh, yeah, Kuiper belts, and people want to look at even uh, comets and stuff. So. Uh, there are and, and moons, maybe, of uh, some of the planets, so we get just tremendous data. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the things that are going to be done in the next four years are refinements or any, any new things that haven't been discussed? Well, it's mostly all that integration stuff. Okay. You know, it's like we have to, like now we're, we're testing all the instruments there together, but you know, you saw the sunshade, they've got a mock, they have mock ups of the telescope together, you have to get the real parts together, we have to integrate, we have to put the, uh, all the segments, we have the segments, but we don't have it built up into a full telescope. That's got to get built up to a full telescope and do that. Goddard got to in integrate the instruments to there, ship it down to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Huntsville in uh, in Texas, and uh, you know do all this testing and stuff. So. Oh, sorry, sorry. Alabama. <laughs> not we're not going to ship it down to Huntsville. We're going to ship it down to Johnson. In Houston. Yes. But the service life it seems to be less than the development time. <laughs> <laughs> It's a cruel um, so world. What's, what's next? Will there be a gap between when this you know, break, breaks down and fails and the next thing? Well, we're trying to get the next one going, and uh, that's this W first thing, that it's going to cost less money, it's going to be less big, and it's going to be totally different science. It's like uh, Kepler showed that you could do a statistical survey. You know, It wasn't a very big telescope, but uh, there's a lot of power in statistics, and it sort of took individual observations and statistically, and that's what we want to do with this other one. So uh, we're really hoping we can get it started and have it launched around 2023, 2024, while web is still going, and they have some overlap. Perhaps if you have other questions, come down after. And San Francisco Amateur Astronomers want to thank you so very much for being here with us tonight. Oh, thank and you. And we look forward to your next visit. <laughs> for sure. Please. Thank you.